Dead faces in the water. Dead faces everywhere. Chapter Sixteen. Rivendell. Summary. Comfort in the sun. Dwarves are not creatures who seek solace in sunlight. They are a people made for dark caves and underground caverns, a people of sheltering stone and cool shadows. And yet, Gimli has somehow found himself taking solace in the sun. He sits upon one of the many benches that lines Rivendell's smooth, pale streets, letting the warmth of the summer day seep into his bones and dispel some of the cold that has felt frozen there since his father died. It is a strange thing for a dwarf to draw comfort from the sun, and yet this valley is a strange place, and every day spent here has been stranger yet. Perhaps in a place such as this, it only makes sense for a dwarf to find comfort in things that would be strange elsewhere. Even the quiet is strange, given the circumstances. Gimli would have expected more turmoil in the wake of the announcement of this new and terrible illness. Elves are flighty creatures, after all everyone knows, and humans are easily riled. But the citizens of Rivendell have continued going about their daily life without panics or riots, as stalwart in the face of possible danger as dwarves. It is strange to look out at this peaceful valley when he knows that there is darkness gathering around them all. Gimli leans back now against the thin wood of his sun-warmed seat, and looks up at the tall, light shapes of Imladris University Teaching and Research Hospital towering overhead. The structures are a mixture of wood and glass, the carvings all fluid curves and curls, and the windows shining in the sun. There are long, open balconies lined with swooping benches and framed with tall arches, courtyards and gazebos and overhangs. Covered walking bridges connect the freestanding structures, and their columns intricately carved and delicate. It is not how dwarves would style a building, but it suits the forest. It suits the elves who live here. Kimli cannot tell where the hospital ends and the university begins. Over the years, the two complexes have spread and sprawled and overlapped until now their structures are hopelessly entangled, their paths and buildings so thoroughly merged that only a native to the valley would have any hope of tracing the lines of their history far enough back to separate them out again. It is strange to see buildings standing so tall in the open air. They look wobbly, almost naked, without the sturdy arms of a mountain wrapped around them. Gimli is not sure he likes it, but then he is not sure that he would be capable of liking any town in which his father died. Perhaps the architecture is not the issue. The other buildings of Rivendell support the same style of design, although they are all much smaller, most only a single story and none more than two. But balconies and long porches are as common on the private structures as they are on the public ones. They sprawl across the valley, interspersed with stands of trees and grassy parks and streams. There are few cars, which seems strange to Gimli. Cars are not common under the mountain either, 
but that is because the lonely mountain is warned with trolleys and pulley cars and lifts there are no dedicated streets for cars rivendell has many smooth narrow streets that wind between its homes and trees but people appear to use them more for walking the vehicles gimli sees trundling down them most often are short buses and trolleys ferrying people back and forth every now and then he glimpses a solitary car or truck all sun or moon powered of course he notes sullenly but they seem to be used only when someone wishes to transport something that is too numerous or heavy to easily carry stranger than the vehicles of rivendell of course are the people gimli is not used to being surrounded by so many people that he must tilt his head to look up at and he does not know if the soreness that often plagues his neck in the evening is a result of spending so many hours craning his neck to look up at the faces of people whose heads stand more than a foot above his own and how much is the lingering ache of his brush with the infection that claimed his father's life elves are the most numerous of rivendell's populace of course for this was an elvish settlement originally back in the ancient days of legend and war but they are nearly equal in population now with the humans who have come to live in the valley in a few more years the humans will probably outnumber the elves gimli muses and he wonders if that will do much to change the culture of rivendell he suspects that it will not this is already a place of such thoroughly mingled elvish and mannish sensibilities that it is often hard for his dwarvish eyes to tell at a glance whether he is looking at an elf or a human there is no mistaking the light musical voices of elvish throats or the star-bright gleam of their eyes for the more grounded speech or sight of humans less grounded than dwarvish voices of course which are low and strong enough that they might better be described as underground voices less grounded than dwarvish eyes which have a gleam of their own although one that shines only in the dark there is no mistaking the languid grace of elvish limbs for the raw vital pulse of human bodies still narrow in their builds by dwarvish standards yes but not so off-puttingly slender as elvish forms which seem to be nothing but spirit wrapped around twig-thin bones and of course the delicate sharpness of tapered elvish cheeks and tall pointed ears are different enough from the rounder solid features of human faces that they could never be mistaken for the same even without the beards that elvish chins never sport and humans only rarely do and then only in thin and scraggly scraps of hair still at a glance they all move with the same measured comfortable pace and greet one another with the same placid good cheer and gentle gestures at a glance they wear the same flowing shirts and embroidered patterns and loose skirts or long trousers at a glance they are both equally strange to dwarvish eyes not that gimli is the only dwarf in rivendell thankfully he does not know what he would do if he were alone entirely in the mourning of his father with no one of his people here to share his sorrow and yet they are not his people they are dwarves but they are strangers to him their ways are not his own 
and the faces beneath the unfamiliar braiding of their beards are not the faces that he knows from his mountain a few of them met Glowen in passing once many years ago when Glowen travelled through rivendell in his own youth none of them knew him none of them were his friends these dwarves are strange to gimli with their elvish ways and they are strangers to him too he is still very much alone in this strange elvish valley strange as rivendell is however it is nothing compared to the strangeness of the elf who flits up to gimli now his loose golden hair bouncing like tufts of dandelion in the breeze behind him. Legolas, Gimli says, a flat acknowledgement rather than a greeting. Legolas smiles brightly and hops onto the bench beside him, crouching on his heels rather than sitting like a proper creature, as seems to be his wont. Gimli tries to remember if he has ever seen this elf sit in a chair the way people do, then wonders why he is wasting the mental effort on someone for whom he cares so little. Legolas is holding some kind of long stem in one hand, and he pinches a small purple bud off of it and sticks it in his mouth. What are you eating? Gimli finds himself asking before he can remember that he doesn't care. Lavender? says Legolas. He holds the stem out. Would you like some? Gimli blinks. No, he says. No, thank you. After a pause, while the elf plucks at his flower buds and tilts his head back to stare up at the trees that line the street beside their bench, Gimli cannot help but ask anxiously, Lavender, which you plucked from someone's garden as you passed? Legolas tilts his head, apparently thinking the possibility over. Then he says, Yes. Ah, uh, says Gimli. He does not know much about gardens or flowers, but he thinks of the humans of Dell and how territorial some of them can be about their homes and the surrounding patches of earth. Perhaps, perhaps you shouldn't do that again, he says gently. Legolas turns his silver-bright eyes on the dwarf and blinks at him. Why? he says, tilting his head the other way now before breaking into a grin again. Oh, no, you do not need to worry, Gimli. It will not hurt the flowers to lose a few buds. We grow lavender in Mirkwood, too, and I know its growth well. It flourishes in the south of our trees especially, or, or it did. He finishes, his voice going soft and a shadow passing across his gleaming eyes. I do not know how it fares now, of course. Legolas ducks his head and turns away. Gimli does not know what to say that will be of any comfort, and he cannot bear to make this strange creature feel worse while he is mourning for his homeland, so he abandons his attempt to explain the concept of private gardens and potentially possessive gardeners. He has a difficult time imagining that anyone in this beautiful valley will take offense to someone plucking a single strand of lavender from their garden anyway. He hopes. After
After a while, Gimli clears his throat and says, Would you like a coffee or a tea or something? My treat. Legolas blinks at him again. Then he says, Thank you, Gimli. Yes. The elf hops up off the bench and follows him down the street. Gimli tries not to notice that Legolas has tucked his stolen sprig of lavender behind one gracefully pointed ear, like a craftsman with a piece of chalk or charcoal. Or perhaps more like a child saving a candy for later. Gimli does not know why he made the offer, only that he was thirsty and it would have been rude to walk off and get himself a beverage without offering one to his companion, even if he hadn't asked for the elf's companionship. But on the other hand, Legolas offered to share his lavender, after all, so Gimli is only being polite. He does not bother to put a great deal of thought into the nature of the café to which he leads them, simply glances down the street for the first likely-looking doorway, marked as so many of them are by little tables outside under small umbrellas. The contraptions look strange to Gimli at first until he remembers that he is standing in a place that has no mountain top to block the rain. He does not know what sort of things an elf is likely to drink, but they are in an elvish valley. Surely every café in this town must offer elvish libations. Rivendell does seem to have an extremely generous proliferation of little watering holes like this, Gimli thinks, as they walk forward through the door with its little jingling bell overhead. Legolas pauses to coo at it, as though he has never seen a shop bell their door to alert them to the presence of customers before. He wonders if it is a result of the school, or the hospital, or both. Perhaps people in this valley simply like tea and coffee more than they do in other places. Gimli strides inside, and then stops short at the sight of a curly-haired child standing behind the counter. No, he realizes. Not a child, but rather a hobbit, beardless as a babe and standing far higher from the ground than her short legs and hairy feet should be capable of lifting her. She strides back and forth behind the human height counter, and as Gimli blinks in shock, he finally takes note of the low steps that protrude around its edge before, presumably, leading to whatever platform has lifted the hobbit up to a height at which she can reach the countertop. It is still a shock to see a hobbit here, even now that he understands how she can be so much taller than her people are known to grow. Hobbits do not give much to traveling, Gimli understands, nor to solitude. Most of them, anyway. There are, he knows, occasional notable exceptions. He wonders how many other hobbits live in Rivendell that have so far gone unnoticed by him. Has he seen some already and mistaken them for human or elvish children? Certainly there cannot be many. He would have seen them by now as they walked the long, smooth streets. But it cannot be none, either. And now the different layers of steps and footrests that Gimli has noticed on half the chairs and benches in this town make sense. They are not all meant for dwarven legs, which is why some of them are too short. Some of them, it seems, are meant for hobbits. 
there are two customers ahead of them in line when they walk in, and Gimli is glad of that. The first, a human carrying a very tall cup of something from which steam is rising despite the mild summer heat outside, is already walking for the door, her order complete. But the second one, an elf wearing a truly absurd number of braids trailing down his long back, is still giving his order to the little hobbit server, who nods and listens to the lengthy description of the elf's desired drink with earnest concentration. Gimli steps aside as the first customer moves towards him. He absently catches Legolas by the sleeve and tugs the elf away from the door chime, opening the passage for the human's departure. Gimli draws a deep breath of the shop, inhaling the rich scent of strong coffee and sharp tea. It is a bracing smell, and it helps him shake off his shock at the sight of a hobbit standing so unexpectedly behind the counter of this cheerful, small café. Legolas finally turns to look inside instead of staring at the door as the second customer steps aside to await the completion of his order. Gimli can see the moment Legolas's eyes land upon the hobbit, and the one a moment later when he realizes what he is seeing. The elf, perhaps predictably, is delighted. Oh, he exclaims, you are a hobbit. I have only ever met one hobbit before. How lovely. Do you know him? He asks, bouncing up to the counter and bracing his wrists against it to lean down and grin at the little hobbit. His name is Bilbo Baggins. Gimli, walking at a more reasonable pace behind the elf, rolls his eyes. He isn't about to admit that he has only ever met one hobbit either, not with the way Legolas is carrying on, but at least he knows better than to assume that every hobbit knows one another, and... What? The hobbit exclaims. You don't mean old mad Baggins. Of course I do. Gimli's jaw drops into his beard. Well, the hobbit continues as Legolas beams at her. When I say no, I don't mean as though we're personal friends or anything. No. In fact, I can't say how I've ever met the fellow properly myself. But certainly I know of him. My man's even been to a few of his birthday parties. Everyone knows Mad Baggins. Or at least knows of him. She grins up at the spindly elf. Of course they do. Legolas is smiling like a sunrise. How wonderful, he says. I have met Bilbo only twice in my life, when he came on visits to Mirkwood, but he is a good friend of my father. Well, of course he is, the little hobbit exclaims seemingly torn between exasperation and pride. That's Mad Baggins, all right, running around all over the place, making friends everywhere, even in Mirkwood. Her voice drops as she says the name of Legolas's homeland, as though it is being spoken in a bedtime hush to frighten the little ones before the lights are put out.
Gimli fights the urge to roll his eyes again, and pauses to frown instead. Baggins, is that the name they said? He was too busy scoffing privately at Legolas to truly listen, but... Yes, they definitely said Baggins. Surely not Bilbo Baggins? Then again, how many Bagginses can there be, let alone Bagginses who will travel across the Misty Mountains and visit Mirkwood? And the Lonely Mountains, too, no doubt, for surely this must be the same Bilbo who is friends, was friends, with Gimli's father. Hobbits do not like to travel, Gimli knows and so surely it must be the very same. How terribly, maddeningly strange to think that he and Legolas have a friend in common, or a friend of their father's in common, at least. Gimli would not call himself a friend of Bilbo's, for he had only spoken to the old hobbit a handful of times usually at great group dinners with all of Glowen and Bilbo's dwarven friends. But he is, was, surely a friend of Glowen's. How odd to think that Bilbo went on to visit with the strange elves of that fearsome forest after he visited the Lonely Mountains. Gimli shakes his head at the absurdity of it all, and stomps up to the counter. He is amused and pleased to see that there are two levels of raised flooring in the front, providing steps to bring a dwarf, or a hobbit, up to proper eye level without making the humans and elves stoop half-doubled down to a too low countertop. It is an ingenious bit of architectural design, and Gimli raises his estimation of Rivendell's designers a smidgen. He still cannot say that he feels any fondness for their frell, intricate, curving elvish style. Still, there is a practicality hidden behind the frippery of it all, and Gimli is craftsman enough to appreciate it. The hobbit finishes whatever she is making for the other elf by pouring it into one metal cup, covering that cup with another, and then shaking them both very hard together. Once she is done, she pours it out into yet another cup, this one made of some soft-looking browned paper, lightly glazed with what seems to be wax, presumably to stop it leaking and topped with a half-lid of a slightly paler paper that seems intended to stop the liquid inside from spilling should someone jostle it. The elf thanks her, nods to Gimli and Legolas with polite disinterest, followed by a swift, uncertain frown as he takes in Legolas's appearance in more detail, and sweeps away out the door with another chiming of the bell. Well, the hobbit says, scampering back along her platform over to the center of the counter and smiling up at both of them, what'll it be, folks? What will be what? Legolas asks, treating the hobbit to that curious little head tilt of his. The hobbit seems amused. Your order? She prompts him. You are here for something to drink, yes? Or a pastry? Or both? Her cheerful grin widens into a mischievous one. Or are you just walking into every building in which you spot a hobbit looking for someone who knows Mad Baggins? Gimli snorts and stomps up to the counter, 
giving Legolas a bemused look as he passes him to climb the steps so that he stands level with the countertop. It is strange to be on nearly eye level with both a hobbit and an elf, the one of whom should be so much shorter and the other so much taller. It is unsettling to be so close to those bright elvish eyes, especially. Gimli is not sure he likes it. He runs his eyes across the menu. Everything appears to be listed twice, once in Westorn and once in some form of elvish, or so Gimli assumes from the familiar letters that have been arranged into unfamiliar words. Unsurprisingly, there are a great many items that he does not recognize, but he is sure that, ah, yes, a coffee shop is a coffee shop, and some things do not change no matter on which side of the Misty Mountains an establishment is located. One hardrum dark roast with two shots of caramel, miss, Gimli says, iced, please and make it to go, if you would." The hobbit smiles. "'What size, then?' she asks. Gimli is not sure what sizes will be like in a place that serves dwarves, elves, humans, and hobbits. He settles for what is likely to be the safest option, and says, "'Medium, please.'" "'Coming right up,' the little hobbit chirps. Legolas watches in rapt fascination as she prepares the drink and pours it into one of the wax-lined paper cups. Gimli scoffs a little under his breath and turns away. He, at least, is not going to pretend that he has never seen coffee poured over ice before. The paper cups are new to him, of course. Coffee shops in the Lonely Mountain serve their drinks in mugs of stone or metal, but they are not such a novelty as to merit the level of fascination that Legolas evinces. And in a town like Rivendell, which is a more sprawling place than the Lonely Mountain, and has a great many more cafes upon its winding streets besides, it probably makes sense to serve drinks in cups that do not need to be returned, but can instead be composted to enrich the valley soil. He makes a mental note to find out what they are made of at some point before he leaves. Depending on what is required to make them, such disposable cups could be useful under the mountain too. He is thinking primarily of the mines, of course, but certainly the resulting compost would do the mushroom gardens no harm. The hobbit hands the drink over, smiling brightly at Gimli's murmur of gratitude, and then turns to look up at the elf standing beside him. And what will it be for you, then? she asks. Legolas blinks. He looks up at the menu, and then down at the hobbit. I do not think I know what any of these things are, he confesses. His voice sounds very small. Gimli looks over at him curiously. You've never tried coffee before? he asks. Legolas shrugs. I have seen it mentioned, he says, on the peanut, but no, I have not. The hobbit frowns at him. They don't have coffee in Mirkwood? Legolas shakes his head. He looks uncomfortable. Gimli stares at the elf, his brain trying, and failing to process Legolas's unfathomable words. Here, Gimli says, and holds his cup out abruptly. Try mine. Uh, there are other varieties, but that'll give you a basic idea of the taste, at least. 
Thank you, says Legolas, and beams at him, as he folds his two long fingers around the cup and lifts it gingerly from Gimli's grip. Part of Gimli is shouting at himself, asking what he thinks he's doing. He ignores it. Mostly, he is baffled by the idea of anyone having lived in the world for so many years, and however many years Legolas has lived, it is surely more than Gimli, and having never tried any coffee at all. Besides, it will do him no harm to be kind to the elf, even if he is strange. Legolas holds Gimli's cup up close to his nose and sniffs it. A curious expression passes across his beardless face, too complicated for Gimli to parse. He does not know how elves ever figure out what one another is thinking without beards to indicate their feelings. Whatever it is, it does not deter Legolas. He tilts the cup and takes a cautious sip, and thrusts it back at Gimli so quickly that the coffee would have sloshed over the edge and onto both of their hands without the little paper lid. Oh, Legolas says in a voice made thick with dismay and confusion. Oh, I do not know. I do not like that. No. Gimli is staring at him and only belatedly moves to raise his hand and take the cup back. The elf's whole face is screwed up in an expression of such bewildered unhappiness that he looks like a dwarfling who has just been tricked by his friends into sucking on a piece of Epsomite for the first time. The Hobbit snorts. I'm not surprised, she says cheerfully. Most elves hate the taste of coffee. Although those who will like it, she adds with a grimace that is half-admiring, really, really do. Really. Why, I've heard that the Dean drinks his own weight in it every day. The Dean? Gimli asks, not really listening. He is too preoccupied by watching the metamorphosis of Legolas's face as the elf processes the full experience of the apparently unprecedented and unpleasant taste of coffee spilling across his tongue. Of the university, the hobbit clarifies helpfully. Dean Edistod? I've never met him, but I believe it. The students like to say that he's only slept 15 hours since the second age. Oh, they're probably exaggerating, of course. Probably. Gimli grunts and pats Legolas on the arm. Well, he says, whatever the Dean drinks, a hearty Haradrim dark roast clearly isn't to your tastes, Legolas. Perhaps a uh, tea? He glances over his shoulder at the hobbit for confirmation. That seems an elvish drink, no? Oh, yes, she says. Tea is very popular. With everybody, really. There's so many different types, after all, that there's something to suit nearly everyone. In fact, hmm. The hobbit purses her lips and narrows her eyes thoughtfully her gaze moving up and down Legolas's lanky form a few times. Finally, she says, Yes, you should try matcha. I think you'd like that. You look like you'd like that. Does it taste like coffee? Legolas asks, a plaintive note in his voice. The hobbit laughs. No, she says. No, it very much does not. Then, says Legolas firmly, I will try it. 
What size? Legolas's eyes flicker to Gimli, then settle back on the hobbit. Medium? He says, his tone making the word a question rather than an answer. The hobbit nods, accepting it anyway, and begins bustling around behind the counter, preparing Legolas's order. Gimli turns away to watch the passage of Rivendell's pedestrians through the shop's window while she works. He sips at his drink. It really is very good. Just the right amount of sweetness to highlight the richness of the roast without undercutting the flavor or turning it syrupy or saccharine. What is that? Legolas asks, and Gimli turns around to see the elf pointing at something along the back counter that holds most of the apparatuses of drink-making. The hobbit looks up and grins. Oh, she says, that's a strawberry milk tea with boba and whooped cream, my favorite. Legolas blinks at the concoction. Gimli leans around his shoulder to look and blinks as well. The drink is a much brighter pink than Gimli thinks a liquid should be allowed to be and the bottom of the glass cup seems to be filled with some kind of bulbous sediment. There is also a thick pile of white whooped cream on top, its soft swirls decorated with sugar crystals of an even more eye-smarting pink than the drink itself. The hobbit eyes Legolas speculatively, then asks, Do you want me to add Boba and whip to your drink. Legolas thinks a moment and then says, I would like to try those things. Yes. Thank you. The Hobbit looks delighted. And sprinkles? She says. Yes, says Legolas firmly. He does not look like he has any idea what sprinkles are, but from the expression on his beardless face, he is not about to let that deter him. And sprinkles. All right, the hobbit says cheerfully and bends to her work. Legolas leans across the counter to watch better. Gimli shakes his head and returns his attention to the street outside. At one point, the meandering flow of pedestrians is interrupted by the passage of a white vehicle with flaring lights on top and the words Imladr's Emergency Response Team painted on the side in yellow letters. Gimli's breath catches in his throat and he has to stop himself from gripping his coffee so tightly that the cup crumbles. But the vehicle drives on, and disappears around the corner, and Gimli forces himself to breathe again. He sips his coffee, and glares at his hand until it stops shaking. Eventually, Legolas's drink is finished, and Gimli cannot help snorting at the sight of the tower of whipped cream that the hobbit has topped it with. Swaths of glittering sugar crystals have been applied so liberally that the white swirl looks more like a rose garden than a snowfall. The hobbit does not put a lid on Legolas's cup. No lid would be able to cover that wobbly tower of sugared cream even if she tried, but instead hands him a wide paper straw. Legolas blinks at it in confusion, but takes the cup and the straw obediently. He sniffs at the drink, looking trepidatious. Gimli doubts he can smell anything but the whipped cream anyways then sticks his tongue out and takes a ginger lap of the crystals and cream. Oh! Legolas exclaims. Oh, that is lovely! 
Yes, the little hobbit says, clapping her hands together. Try the boba now. Legolas looks at the drink in his hand, and then back at the hobbit. I am not sure how to get to it without spilling everything, he confesses. The hobbit giggles. With the straw, silly, she says. Legolas blinks at her. What straw? he asks. The hobbit raises her eyebrows at him. So does Gimli. The one in your other hand? the hobbit says. Legolas glances at it with a frown. This is not made of straw, he says. Gimli snorts. Not straw like hay or oats, a straw for drinking. Come, even in Mirkwood, surely they have straws. The hobbit takes pity on them both by grabbing her own whooped cream topped travesty from the back counter and taking a sip. Like this, she says encouragingly. Legolas pokes his straw through the tower of whooped cream and closes his lips around it. Gimli thinks that he has never seen anyone make using a straw look more awkward, then has to revise his opinion when Legolas nearly chokes on his first sip. That is awkward. Watch the boba, the hobbit cautions, too late. Legolas coughs and clears his throat and tries again more carefully this time. Oh, he says. Oh, this is very good. This is wonderful. Thank you. The hobbit relaxes, her face curling back into her apparently customary cheerful grin. Great, she says. I thought you'd like it. Just remember to chew the boba, and you'll be fine, I'm sure. Gimli cannot help but smile, even as he shakes his head at the absurd sight of the elf very seriously attempting to master the use of a straw for the first time. What do I owe you? he says. For both the drinks, please. For Thranis she replies promptly, and Gimli fishes the corresponding coins out of his purse. Legolas leans over curiously. Gimli tries not to flinch at the way his tower of whipped cream wobbles at the motion. The sugar sprinkles that coat it are very pink. He pockets a few napkins in anticipation of future concerns with the unstable concoction. What are those? Legolas asks, pointing at the round silver discs in Gimli's other hand. Coins? Gimli raises an eyebrow. Do you not use the Gondorian standard in Mirkwood? Oh! Legolas exclaims, this is money. He picks up one of the little silver bits and turns it over a few times in his fingers. No, he says, shaking his head as he puts it back down on the counter. We do not use money in Mirkwood. Gimli and the hobbits both stare at him. How do you pay for things? The hobbit asks eventually. How do you buy things? We do not, says Legolas. Oh, he corrects himself under their bewildered stares. Although when someone orders something off the peanut, when Taralas has coin sent to the person who made it to thank them for shipping to the forest. That is, buying things, yes?
they stare at him some more. Or when we go to one of the market days in Dell, Legolas suggests a bit desperately. And afterwards there is a tally made, and whoever is in charge of the market coin that day brings some around to the different stalls as thanks for the lovely things that they made that we enjoyed. That is, buying two, yes? They stare some more. Eventually, Gimli says, Uh, yes. Yes, that's... That's what that is, I suppose. Yes. He does not know why he is so surprised. He has heard the stories and jokes about Mirkwood, just like everyone else. He is from the Lonely Mountain, only a short drive from the borders of the forest. He has laughed many times at the japes about Mirkwood's elves not understanding how money works and consequently being happy to overpay for the most ridiculous things, walking off whistling with good cheer after having been ripped off without realizing, or trying to pay for something expensive with a stick or a handful of leaves. He has laughed, but he always assumed they were jokes. Until this moment, Staring at Legolas's bewildered, beardless face, he had not realized the jokes were real. Ah, uh, Gimli says again, turning back to the hobbit and mustering a smile. Well, thank you, miss. We'll, uh, we'll be off now. Thank you for the drinks, and may your day be a pleasant one. Right. The hobbit chirps, still looking a bit shell-shocked. She seems unable to pull her big brown eyes away from Legolas. Yes, uh, thank you, and likewise, I'm sure. Good day, gentle beings. Gimli ushers the elf out of the door as he offers his own grateful farewell and compliments for the sprinkles. The pill of the little bell jingling overhead, announcing their departure, sounds a little too much like a reprieve to Gimli's ears. They walk down the streets together, Gimli moving fast as though to put distance between himself and the awkwardness of the scene in the café. Legolas, with his absurdly long legs, keeps up easily even though he is clearly distracted by either the complexities of his straw or some other deep thoughts. After two blocks, it becomes clear that it was, at least in part, the latter, because the elf asks, Gimli, the money that you gave the hobbit lass, that seemed important, yes? Uh, says Gimli. Yes, that is how people buy things. Outside of Mirkwood. Oh, says Legolas. He thinks a little more, and sucks up another piece of boba, which he chews with great care before he swallows. And must most things be bought like that? With money given over afterwards in gratitude? Uh, Gimli says again. Yes, that is one way to phrase the process, I suppose. How would you phrase it? Well, it's an exchange of goods, isn't it? 
Gimli says, a bit bewildered. How is he supposed to explain something like this to someone who clearly lacks all context for the concept? Like bartering only with set prices, usually, and you use coins instead of goods because they're easier to carry around, especially when one is traveling somewhere. It's a thing of convenience, money. I see says Legolas. He does not sound as though he does. And you do this every time you buy something? Each person singly carries coin of their own? Yes, says Gimli, and then because he cannot help but ask, How is it done in Mirkwood? When you want something that someone else has made, or when you have made something you wish to sell. I am not sure what sell means, Legolas says. I am sorry, my western is rustier than it ought to be, it seems. But we simply give people things when we wish to share them, or... We leave them in a place for others to take when they may have need of them. We do not have... have cafes and coffee and coins. He shakes his head. Just the forest and each other. Ah, oh, says Gimli. He does not think he understands Legolas any better than the elf understands money, but he does not think he will get a better explanation out of him right now, either. It sounds as though the whole forest operates communally, the way a dwarven family does, but he cannot fathom how such a thing would work on so large a scale. There must be some logistic he is missing, something that is so natural to Legolas's view of the world that he does not even realize that it needs to be explained when speaking to a stranger. It reminds Gimli of the first time a dwarf encounters someone not of the people, someone who does not understand the Song of Stone and cannot grasp the concept of voices in the rock, no matter how clearly said dwarf explains. It is always jarring, that first time, to realize there are not enough words in Westorn to explain the concept, to realize that the ears and bones of non-dwarves are simply not equipped to hear this thing that is such an integral part of dwarven nature that it does not even need words to be known. Well, he knew Legolas was strange, knowing that he doesn't even understand the basic foundations of life like money and barter only cement a little harder just how strange. Gimli makes a mental note to keep an eye out for the elf and make sure he does not get himself into trouble through his lack of understanding. He suspects that the people of Rivendell will be largely kind about it when Legolas evinces confusion about the concept of cost and payment. That will not negate the fact that they will expect payment afterwards. Someone clearly needs to watch out for this strange forest creature. Although, Gimli realizes abruptly, that does not necessarily mean that that someone needs to be him, of course. For a while, he does not speak as they meander down Rivendell's smooth, tree-lined streets. Legolas seems content to investigate the newness of his drink, coaxing up bits of boba through his straw and licking at his sprinkle-coated whipped cream. Gimli sips his own coffee, but he is not thinking about its taste. Instead, 
he studies the elf. After a while, he says tentatively, Legolas, may I ask what might sound like a very rude question? Understand, I mean no offense, Gimli hastens to add. I am merely curious, not... Yes, of course, Legolas replies at once, looking up from his drink before Gimli can even finish the question. What is it, Gimli? It is only... well, why is it that you seek my company? There are so many here in Rivendell you could spend your time with. Why do you continually come to me? Does my presence distress you? Legolas asks, his head again tilting sideways like a curious yellow-feathered bird. I will leave. No, Gimli replies hurriedly. No, I merely wonder. Oh. For a while, Legolas says nothing, only sips his drink, his smooth face furrowed as though in heavy thought. When he speaks, his light voice is low. It was my inattention that led to the misery of your near affliction, Gimli, and it was my arrow that felled your father. I suppose that I cannot help but feel responsible for your circumstances, then, for you. Gimli notes that Legolas does not specify whether it was good or bad that Glawn was slain. He suspects that Legolas understands somehow that it was both. Legolas's arrow saved Gimli and ended his father's suffering, but it also ended his father. That knowledge is a complicated thing to fill, and Gimli is grateful that Legolas does not press him to make it simpler. You are not responsible, Gimli manages to say after a while, or any of that. Legolas looks up from his drink and smiles at him, but he does not answer either to agree or to protest. There is a dollop of whipped cream on the tip of his narrow nose. Gimli gropes into his pocket for a napkin and shoves it into Legolas's hand, indicating with a grunt and a nod the reason for the offering. He turns away quickly from the ridiculous sight while the elf laughs and cleans his face. Also, Legolas says so softly that the words are almost lost in the whisper of their feet across the smooth stone street. I suppose that I feel somewhat out of place here. You do? Gimli cannot stop his eyebrows from raising in disbelief. But this is an elvish valley, and you are an elf. Legolas shakes his head. His beardless face looks troubled somehow, and at once very young and also very old. I am a wood elf of Mirkwood, he clarifies, and this is a valley of elves and humans, both who are very different from those of us who dwell in that forest. This place is strange to me, as are its people. Too, I am strange to them. Gimli feels his cheeks warming, and he looks down, sipping his iced coffee with determination, less to suck it dry than to hide the flush of embarrassment spreading behind his beard. He had certainly thought Legolas strange more than once himself, 
although he has at least kept that thought within the privacy of his own head or he has tried to at least although there is no denying that he failed to hide his shock in the cafe and in their conversation after i do not mind being strange legolas continues almost as though he has heard gimli's private scolding and wishes to mitigate it but i am left feeling off balance perhaps might be the best way to describe it although i am not sure i have never actually found myself unbalanced on branch or earth before but from how i have heard the sensation described i believe that it is close at least to how i feel here in this valley he spins around right there in the middle of the street his arms flung wide Gimli is astonished that he manages to execute the gesture without knocking the whole quivering tower of pink-sprinkled cream off his tea. "'Everything is so open, Gimli!' Legolas exclaims as he twists forward to walk beside the dwarf again. "'The trees are old and tall, yes?' but they are spaced so far apart and their branches are so smooth and straight there is so much sunlight here gimli there are no knots of leaf and bough where many trees mingle into one no deep patches of shadows where the trees grow so close together they blot out the sun with their very leaves there are no spiders no bone deer no moss foxes no lichen stags no unhoused shades whispering from the deepest parts of the woods Gimli cannot help but gape at Legolas's litany of myths and monsters. Living as he does in the Lonely Mountain, Gimli has always believed that he knows more of Mirkwood than most of Middle-earth, for the forest is only a short drive away. And yet, he has never been there. He has spent his whole life being warned away from the place, in fact. Warned away from the gnarled trees and the black river and the twisted moss-covered trunks through which sharp-eyed, sharp-toothed things creep that can be found nowhere else in Middle-earth. Trees through which strange, half-feral wood elves flit fey and laughing and dangerous legolas does not seem dangerous even when he put an arrow through glawn's eye he did not seem dangerous but to hear him talk about his forest now those tall black trees and those prowling creatures whose existence was always more rumor than certainty to the dwarfs of the lonely mountain those strange predatory things that ought to exist only in nightmares and legends not walking in truth through the world today to hear him talk about those things with such joy and longing in his voice gimli is left flabbergasted it is one thing to know there are people who live in the murder forest it is something else altogether to be confronted with the reality that the people who live there love it yes gimli manages to say at last yes i can see where this valley would be strange to you then compared to that he takes a deep breath and manages a smile as he adds it is strange to me too you know 
I'm used to living inside a mountain, not walking out here always in open air and the shining sun. And there are so few beards on these streets, he complains. All these bare faces, these naked chins. Ugh! Gimli shakes his head. It is like being surrounded by nothing but very, very tall children. Legolas's laughter rises up like silver bells, bright and unfettered and contagious. Gimli cannot help chuckling along in a deeper, coarser counterpoint. Well then, Legolas says, grinning down at Gimli. His eyes dance like bright stars against his smooth, beardless brown cheeks. You understand? Also, I have never been far from Mirkwood before, and everything here is new to me, a stranger. I do not quite know how I should act to meet new people. I have never had to do it before, beyond passing a few words back and forth in Jadel markets. The elves who live in my forest I have all grown up alongside, and either I have known them all my life, or all of theirs. I do not quite know how meeting someone ought to go, and so, he confesses, I find myself clinging to what is familiar here amidst so much that is strange and new. But we haven't met before, Gimli protests. He frowns. Have we? I do not think it likely, Legolas says. Perhaps in passing, in those markets, but I have not been to the market in some fifty years or more. I think you would have been very young then, if we had met at all, yes? Gimli blinks, reminded suddenly of how very old elves are. It is strange to think of it, because Legolas seems so young. But then, by the standard of elves, perhaps he is. I would have been young, yes, Gimli admits. Still a youth by the standards of my people, probably, or perhaps on the brink of adulthood, but young, yes. Legolas nods and licks some of the whipped cream off of his towering drink. He misses his nose this time, at least, but his lips glitter with lingering sprinkles. Well, he says, at any rate, I was not speaking of familiarity in quite that context. We did not know each other before we came to this valley, no, but, well... He draws his shoulders in tight, raising them in a short, hunched-like shrug, and will not meet Gimli's eyes. There was no need to meet you, Legolas says quietly, given the way we did meet, I mean. He glances over, then away again quickly. And you feel strange here too, I could tell you did, from the way you look at things. It is very like the way I look at them here too, I think. And there is a comfort to that, to know that I am not the only one who feels himself to be somewhere strange and alone. I see, Gimli murmurs. He strokes his beard and sips his coffee. Yes, he says. Yes, I see. 
they make their way together to another bench a little further down the street away from the bustle of the university it looks out over a bubbling stream and gimli sits for a while and drinks his coffee and lets the noise of the water wash over him lets the complexity of his feelings wash over him Legolas perches on the top of the bench this time, which at least keeps his knees down below his ribcage for once, even if it is only a slightly more civilized way to sit. He investigates the little round black pearls in his drink with evident delight, but he does not speak, and yet the silence between them is not a strained one. Perhaps these are thoughts that it is good to think of in the sun, for all that it is not a dwarvish thing to turn to for comfort. Perhaps this valley is a good place for healing, even outside the walls of the hospital. If you do feel my company distressing, Legolas says after a while, I will not be offended by that. You may speak freely and know that I will not take the truth of your heart as an insult to my own. I understand that the, the feelings that one can have after such a thing as your father's death are not always easy or straightforward things. My mother, he tells Gimli quietly, also fell victim to this sickness, so I do understand. Gimli turns to stare up at the elf. Legolas is not looking at him, though. He is not looking at the water either, Gimli thinks, for all that his grey-green eyes are fixed on the sparkling dance of the sun-dappled stream. His gaze is far away, deep in the shadows of his woodland home. I shot her too, Legolas tells him, when her teeth were in my father's throat. I think... His breath catches, then evens out again in a steady whisper that seems to mingle with the music of the stream. No, I know that my father still blames him. No! Gimli does not mean to interrupt, but the word burst past his lips like a bubble of magma that cannot be quenched. No, Legolas he says, and grips the elf's thin ankle tightly. No, he does not blame you. No father worthy the name would blame his son for being forced to do such a thing. Whether he might have said it in his pain, he doesn't blame you. I promise that. Legolas has finally pulled his eyes away from his memories. He stares instead at Gimli, his expression startled. He blinks slowly, in evident confusion. I know he does not, Legolas says. He blames himself. That is what I meant to say. He blames himself for not having been faster with his sword, for not having spared me the pain of having to make such a shot by ending her dead life himself before I could. Legolas shakes his head. Of course he does not blame me, Gimli. It is as you said. He blames himself, although he does not deserve to either. Neither of us are to blame for what we have done or been unable to do in our struggle against the dead, I think. It is not a thing any of us would have chosen to endure, 
we can only do our best to do so and to save those we can and end the suffering of those whom we cannot. Oh, says Gimli. I, I think that too, he says, and realizes as he speaks them that the words are true. The words are true. He does not blame Legolas for Glawin's death. His father was already dead when that arrow pierced his eye, and his death was not Legolas's doing. I am... Um, I am sorry that I didn't let you finish what you were saying and jumped to conclusions about your da. No harm done, says Legolas, smiling at him. You spoke from your heart and I appreciate your defense of me, even if it was not needed. It was still a kind thing to say. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, Gimli mutters. He feels something like a fool as he takes his hand away from the elf's leg. He wraps it around his coffee cup, which at least gives him something to do with it. He can feel his cheeks burning beneath his beard, and is glad at least that Legolas has not laughed at him. But then it is hardly a conversation suited for laughter. I am sorry, Gimli says at last. Sorry that you had to do such a thing. I am sorry too, Legolas says. For us both, and for the dead as well. Yes, says Gimli. Yes, so am I. They sit for a while in companionable silence, sipping from their cups and watching the flow of the crystalline water before them. It is strange for a dwarf to sit basking in the sun like this. Stranger still for him to draw such comfort from the presence of an elf. And yet Gimli does find comfort in Legolas's presence, for all that this fey wood elf is the strangest creature that Gimli has ever met before. Strange, yes, but brave and kind, too. Perhaps it is not so strange a thing to draw comfort from a person like that, or a valley such as this, even for a dwarf. Or perhaps it is. Yet in a world where the dead walk, what value is there in clinging to what once was normal? Normal will clearly no longer avail them, not against the dead. Perhaps strangeness will. At the least, Gimli thinks, it cannot make things worse. Up next, a brief text interlude. <laughs> 